Are we are we on? Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, the a big uh, part of the course will be dedicated to um, various uh, what are called qubits, quantum bits, uh, elements of a quantum computer. But really, they are just uh, the same systems we already talked about: um, single particles or single quantized degrees of freedom. And uh, the reason why uh, we call them qubits is for applications in quantum computing, but the reason why we study them is broader than just these applications. It is uh, because we can now control single degrees of freedom in a solid with uh, amazing precision, like a single electron of its spin or some circulating little current or single photons. So we have reached this experimental skill where we can do this and we can um, think about a unifying description for all these systems, and qubits are a very convenient language for that. So the quantum two-level systems, um, that concept unifies many different experimental efforts that are going on. And it is also very interesting to uh, build a quantum computer, work towards that, at least try. It's a wonderful challenge that combines the engineering and uh, physics and computer science and uh, um, other uh, disciplines, material science, very important uh, in this context. And so uh, it is just a wonderful field to work in because you can collaborate with many different uh, groups, working towards the same goal, try to solve puzzles which are not entirely physics, but also engineering, electrical engineering, materials. So you learn a lot. And uh, uh, for me, it was, uh, I really wanted to, to be in this field because for these reasons. Uh, and uh, the field of quantum transport, um, as we reviewed it for uh, the last 10 lectures, uh, that was uh, mostly the, uh, the early years of quantum transport. But that field uh, sort of merged very naturally into quantum computing. Uh, and so many of the quantum transport experiments done these days have quantum computation in mind as a potential long-term application. Uh, and therefore, it is... Uh, a good idea, I think, to spend uh, one lecture on the basics of qubits, uh, um, a little bit from the experimental point of view, but also conceptual. And maybe some of you have already seen this stuff before, uh, but uh, some of you haven't for sure. And so we should be on the same page in terms of qubits before we move on and study particular qubits, like spin qubits or flux qubits or charge qubits. or needless to say, topological qubits. That, there you really need to understand qubits before you can uh, understand what those topological qubits are even good for, why people even think about such crazy things. So this will be our um, plan for today. Um, the entire lecture will be um, subdivided into um, discussing the various Di Vincenzo criteria, of which the main ones are five. And they kind of lay out the basic requirements. What does your physical system have to fulfill uh, to have a chance at becoming a quantum computer? Um, and um, so we will divide the lecture in, uh, in these criteria and uh, look at the potential systems at the end. So uh, here are. Di Vincenzo criteria, very important concept. You, it's ubiquitous in the field. You always run into the mentions of these criteria. This is David Di Vincenzo. Um, so first of all, you need to have qubits. Um, so you need to have a uh, well-defined quantum two-level system. So the, the levels can be labeled 0 and 1. 0 is the ground state. 1 is the excited state. Um, and um, this, uh, so there has to be a physical implementation of this system. And that physical implementation fulfills five main criteria. And there are also then auxiliary criteria expanding the, uh, the scope uh, for the requirements for a quantum network. Um, now, uh, this um, 
two-level quantum system, uh, it's not enough just to have it, to have it in your lab. It has to do certain things. Uh, for example, you should be able to initialize it. You better be able to start with a well-known state. Uh, the simplest example, initialize everything in 0, 0, 0, 0, ground state. But any other state will work, as long as it's always the same state. That is required to do something consistent uh, with your computation. You want to start in a, in a state that is well defined. So that's an important requirement. Uh, the next requirement is that you want to um, go from this uh, foundational state, the starting state, to any other state. What is the space of states? Well, it's a Hilbert space of quantum superpositions of states of all the qubits that you have. So if we just take one qubit, uh, this would be uh, all possible superpositions of 0 and 1. You need to be able to access any arbitrary superposition uh, by uh, performing manipulations on every single qubit in your quantum computer. So if you're just changing the quantum state of a single qubit, that is called single qubit gate. Gate, a term borrowed from classical computing, from just computing. Uh, gates are operations you do with information in this context, not to be confused with electrostatic gates that we run into almost every, every lecture, right? So logical gate. So single qubit gate, prepare arbitrary superposition. And then, of course, you need to be able to do that for every qubit that you have. And you might want to have thousands. So you have prepare a superposition here, here, here. Well, um, you can see at this as important. Uh, already just, to, um, just from the notion of quantum information, where information is stored in superpositions of states, uh, it is clear that you need to prepare these superpositions right, in each qubit. And uh, if you just prepare a bunch of unconnected superpositions, you can view it as a memory register. If you, you store a string of quantum information in this register of qubits. Now, that is still not enough to take advantage of uh, uh, the force of quantum computation. Very importantly, that force, uh, you may have heard exponential speed up in computational uh, uh, speed for certain algorithms. So quantum computer is fundamentally faster than a classical computer in certain situations. But you need to take advantage of what is called quantum parallelism. And that is, comes from being able to create uh, entangled states between all these qubits. So uh, a state in which you cannot uh, write down the quantum state of this system as a quantum state of this qubit, product to a quantum state of this qubit, product to a quantum state of this qubit. This kind of state would have zero entanglement. Uh, if you ju can just uh, write it out in, as a product of states of individual qubits. If you cannot do that, for example, a state which is a superposition of 0, 0 and uh, 1, 1. Yeah. That state is an entangled state. cannot be written into a, a multiplier that is just belong to this qubit and a multiplier just belong to this qubit. So uh, if you have entangled all your qubits in a register or a large fraction of them, uh, then quantum algorithms start to work and you get this exponential speed up. I'm not going to explain today how that works. Uh, I'm, I will try to have a separate lecture on that uh, later in the course, on the quantum algorithms that you can do, and what people have already done, some of them, uh, very spectacularly. Uh, but uh, for now, I just want to say that you need to be able to entangle multiple qubits together. And in order to do that, you need to be able to perform two qubit gates, so gates that change the quantum states of uh, two qubits and couple them together. So two qubit gates. 
single qubit gates and two qubit gates form what is called a universal quantum set of gates. So in order for a physical system, like some two-level system, to be viable as a quantum computer, uh, you need to be able to perform a set of universal quantum gates on that system, including single gates and two qubit gates. Yes. Okay. So they can have different energies. The topological qubit yes. has a degenerate state. Yeah. Okay. And so there are other examples. Yeah, there's a reason I think we should change the level. Change it to two state system, not two level system. Well, there are still two levels, they just have the same energy. Uh, well, it's okay. Yeah, I, this is this is the same. Okay, so uh, then, of course, you need to be able to read out the quantum state of each qubit individually. So there has to be a physical process that tells you whether the qubit is in zero or one. Um, could be a charge measurement, like in a charge sensor, or a flux measurement measurement of current or a measurement of um, photon intensity coming from a level some kind of a readout mechanism right so this is still on a, a very fundamental physical level on a hardware level all these requirements yeah? so the, we, we don't go into algorithms at all here this is just hardware and of course uh, all of this you want to do very well with high fidelity with high uh, reliability. So if you um, initialize the system, uh, you want to be initializing with a 99.999% accuracy in this state. That you, if you cannot do that, you cannot run complex quantum algorithms. Same goes for gates. Gates have to be uh, well controlled, accurate, and the readout has to also be uh, a good readout with high readout fidelity. Okay, and then um, you should be able to uh, correct for errors in your, in your system. Uh, and this is a, a fascinating concept, decoherence. Um, it's, it's very easy to explain it in terms of quantum computing. It's just that uh, you've initialized these qubits, you prepared some single and double qubit gates, you create some states, and then you run an algorithm which consists of these gates. But as you do that, uh, some of these bits flip, flip, flip. Uh, there are errors. That's how you describe decoherence uh, uh, in terms of qubits. There are errors. Um, there is a much uh, broader and more philosophical view on decoherence, which is that uh, how come on the scale of atoms we can describe our universe in terms of uh, quantum systems with discrete levels and such. And as we build up to the scale of humans, uh, we behave uh, classically like, like Newton prescribed. Uh, so where does this transition happen from quantum to classical? Uh, well, um, there are different views. Prevailing view is that uh, decoherence, uh, interaction with, uh, of a single quantum degree of freedom, just like qubit, with multiple objects, multiple quantum systems around it leads to randomization of, uh, of this state. So when you coupled to your environment, uh, which is uh, always the case to some degree, uh, you're going to, over time, lose, uh, lose this uh, uh, superposition. And actually, a quantum description of decoherence is entanglement of the qubit to millions of degrees of freedom around it, like a million nuclei in a quantum dot coupled to a, a single electron spin, you can think of them as all being entangled with, with the spin and uh, uh, causing decoherence. So you need a way to fight decoherence. You need uh, to have, um, first of all, good coherence properties so that the state is long-lived. 
um, in arbitrary superposition, right? It's easy to live in a ground state. Just relax to the ground state and stay there. But if you excite into a superposition, keep that superposition, that's pretty hard. Um, so you have to be able to do maybe some error correction algorithms, um, run a sequence of gates that figures out, oh, this qubit flipped. We have to flip it back. Um, so there are various algorithms for that. OK, so how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five. That's right. Uh, there are five DiVincenzo criteria, which are the fundamental criteria. So any qubit we want to talk about, we have to have at least a pathway to this. So if our qubit is, um, for example, a wonderful two-level system, which you can perform single qubit gates upon, but you cannot scale it to a thousand qubits and perform all these universal set of gates, it's not going to work as a quantum computer. So we put it on a shelf, look for something else. So scalability is also a very important criteria. All the stuff you do with one qubit, you want to be able to do it with a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand qubits. Uh, I already mentioned there is an extended set of DiVincenzo criteria. Um, I think there are another five or so, but here is one that is uh, kind of easy to understand the desire for. It's that if you have a quantum computer here and another one in the, in the next country, if you're in Europe or in the next state, uh, you want to be able to send quantum information long distance. Not even so extreme. Even on the same chip, you might have, uh, uh, your chip might have a finite distance, and you might want to travel your quantum information um, even a few millimeters. That's already a challenge, because uh, all of these qubits, they're all uh, nanoscale objects. And how to send the information from one nanoscale object to another one, separated by many times their size, how to couple them, and how to preserve superposition in this process. So uh, you need some kind of flying qubits. Photons are a natural uh, proposal for that, because uh, they maintain their polarization for miles if you send them down the fiber. So indeed, uh, let's start on the DiVincenzo criteria, well-defined two-level systems. Uh, spin is a wonderful example, and a zero magnetic field, spin up and spin down, would be the same. Uh, though most of the proposals rely on this system at finite magnetic field, where we can distinguish them and therefore read them out, but also control them. And photon, also very easy to understand. You can uh, create superpositions of uh, light states. Uh, in two different polarizations. Uh, could be vertical and horizontal, could be circular, clockwise and counterclockwise. Um, there are different bases. There is a conversion between them even. So you can uh, think about photons. Uh, here are some of the more complicated and certainly less intuitive examples, but actually these two represent some of the best qubits we have right now. So, so we, we st when, if you just start thinking about quantum computing, you would come up with these, uh, with these guys. And uh, people are working on that. But then, actually, <laughs> when you try to build one and try to find a good system, you may run into uh, this kind of a system, uh, calcium plus ion. Uh, I'll tell you later what, what the details are, uh, but for now, uh, who can guess which two levels are forming a qubit? These are some levels of a uh, calcium ion. Actually, one of the simplest ions that they have. Well, uh, I had to look it up. Uh, <laughs> and so I don't expect you to immediately figure it out. In fact, this would be the zero state. And one of these guys, 
I think five halves, this would be the one state. This turns to, out to, to work great. And they use these other levels to read out and initialize this qubit. So they uh, control this qubit by different laser light. And you can see the wavelengths written down here. There are all kinds of different wavelengths. Uh, so you need several lasers to um, control the qubit. So go between 0 and 1. Uh, a different ones to read out and uh, something else to uh, initialize, to uh, pump all the population wherever it might be to the ground state with high fidelity. And th this is one of the best uh, qubits uh, that we have right now. Uh, this is also very unintuitive. I already m showed it once in my talk, but um, what this is is a circuit, electrical circuit. It's superconducting. And this thing here, this is a superconducting qubit. Turns out it has um, quantum levels. If you cool it down low enough and you know, go into the quantum regime, you can find some anti-crossings. Uh, which tell you that something quantum is happening. And uh, you can say that the lower level is 0 and the higher level is 1. Uh, what these levels are, they are uh, current circulating clockwise and counterclockwise in this macroscopic circuit. So current made out of billions of electrons uh, flowing at the same time left and right. That's kind of a simple idea behind this qubit. But you can see that the structure of levels is fairly complex. Um, and this circuit here is the readout of this qubit. Now, um, it is natural to ask why qubits? Why not qtrits, systems with three levels? Why not qns, systems with n levels? Uh, well, uh, you, can, you can try different things. Uh, um, some people, some algorithms rely on three, three level systems and some things become easier in, in those systems. Uh, qubits are, um, have advantage over these systems, uh, which is, for example, this. Um, so in a system with n levels, uh, you can store uh, the same amount of information because you have two to the n combinations. You can store about the same amount of information. And actually, you get uh, better accuracy because uh, all of these levels can, in principle, be distinguished very easily. They can have different energies. Um, whereas if you just have uh, uh, n qubits, so here for the case of 3, some of these levels will have the same energies, uh, like 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 0 would all have the same energy. So there will be some degeneracies. And so there are only four distinct energies uh, in this situation. So maybe that makes it harder to work with. But what if you need not n qubits, but n plus 1 qubit? Well, here it's easy. You just add another one and couple it. Uh, and you scaled your quantum computer up. In this case, you would have to. Uh, throw out whatever this is and look in your periodic table or in your electronics program to now create a system with one extra level. That's, that's not going to work. So it's not scalable. There is another problem that if you st start making more and more levels, the density of levels grows. And uh, at some point, it becomes very difficult to address individual levels from a practical point of view. Because uh, any control pulse, any readout pulse, uh, you would imagine it as having a certain width. And if the density of these levels becomes too high, uh, you get kind of uh, spectral crowding. It's a big problem in quantum computing. How to address individual qubits if they all have the same frequency. So um, we are after, in this lecture, certainty, certainly a, a system of n coupled qubits. Now, um, the answer of a quantum measurement is a probability. 
to, and to determine the probability, you need to perform the same experiment many times. And to, um, to do that, you have to do an ensemble measurement. Uh, but once again, uh, you can do an ensemble measurement on a, a system of coupled qubits, or you can have um, multiple copies of the same system and uh, measure them at once, and you get an ensemble uh, that way. Right? Two different ways of getting an ensemble. Repeat on the same thing uh, 100 times or measure 100 different things. It's all the same. Um, and uh, there are examples of uh, systems where you actually have physically uh, ability to make uh, a million copies of the same quantum computer. Uh, one example is uh, these molecules, uh, each of the atoms has uh, spins and uh, these spins are all coupled. Uh, so you just have a solution of these molecules in a tube and you measure their spin properties by microwaves, by uh, NMR techniques, and uh, you measure an ensemble average over millions of these molecules, uh, each of which is a little quantum computer. Uh, here's another example, uh, a little bit hard to see, but this is a semiconductor heterostructure. Uh, with the different layers, dark, uh, light, dark, uh, indium arsenide and gallium arsenide. And here, the two bright lines uh, designate uh, two uh, aligned bumps. Here you can see them better. Bump in one layer, bump in another layer. These are two quantum dots. Uh, the way they grow them, you get a layer of them uh, coupled pairwise like that. So they, the first layer nucleates and then the second dot nucleates on top. It prefers to do that. It's easier energetically for it to do that. So here you have um, uh, thousands of copies of the same two qubit system. So you can just shine light on this whole sample, get some answer, and it will be averaged over millions of these quantum dots. But each of them will be a two qubit quantum computer. Now here's an example of a system where um, you have uh, many copies of each qubit and then they're all coupled. Uh, so the difference is several coupled qubits and then many copies of that or several copies of one qubit coupled to several copies of another qubit etc. That is actually bad because now all these qubits uh, they may be in some random states and then you so this will be a, in quantum description a mixed state uh, and then you couple it to another mixed state and another mixed state and so the degree of actual entanglement here is zero very low and you cannot take advantage of uh, quantum computation so this kind of device will be useless. And this is a kind of a representation of what decoherence does for you. Uh, every time you measure, you kind of get a different qubit in a diff slightly different state, and then you entangle it with a different qubit here and a different qubit here. Every time you get a different answer, everything breaks down. Let's keep track of the time here. Now, uh, qubits, uh, they do not uh, have to be just uh, physical two-level systems uh, in the most primitive sense, like a single ion or a single spin. We can also define um, qubits uh, made up of uh, multiple individual physical systems. Like, we can define a qubit based on two electrons. Uh, two coupled electrons would be, let's say, spins, and uh, they uh, would be in a, each would be in a state of zero and one of its own, but we will define a qubit um, on a two electron system uh, between these two states, for example. These two actually, uh, you can see that these states are entangled. I cannot write them down in terms of the left qubit and the right qubit. So the two indices are for the left and the right qubits. Um, so this, uh, this qubit is, uh, uh, may have some advantages because 
these two states might be protected from a certain noise. Uh, in a particular example, if these are the two certain kind of charge noise. And then we enter, um, for these two levels, a decoherence-free subspace, it is called. So a uh, parameter space where uh, maybe environment fluctuates around you, and it affects individual qubits, 0 and 1 may change. But these states are protected. And so these make a better qubit. Or even uh, states with uh, involve three different electrons. So here is a state that has three different um, particles in it. Uh, and we just define a qubit between the two states of this uh, three particle system. So maybe in another basis, we could rewrite it as uh, three different qubits. But uh, we just say we're going to use these two states for our quantum computation and uh, try to see if the Vincenzo criteria apply to all these states. So in the case, again, of spin qubits, going for uh, three states like that um, eliminates the need to apply AC magnetic fields to the system. And uh, you can just rely on uh, coupling and decoupling electrons by gates. So you um, have an easier time of implementing universal gates. And so, so this one benefits the universal gates criterion. This one benefits the decoherence criterion. You have to kind of balance and see what works in each individual implementation. Now, initialization is the next criteria, next DiVincenzo criteria. Uh, the simplest way to do that is to just let the system relax to its ground state. So you start with a system in some thermal state. And if you cool it down low enough uh, and wait for some relaxation time, uh, all of the qubits will end up in zero state, in the ground state. Um, if you are working with uh, sort of room temperature uh, systems, um, like atomic orbitals, which behave quantum mechanically even at room temperature. Um, at room temperature, you're going to have a very easy time of doing that because the energy distance between ground and excited is of order electron volt, and the temperature is only 26 milli electron volt. So it will not excite you into the uh, higher state, uh, even at room temperature. If you work with single spins of an electron, um, you um, have a harder time because uh, you put that spin in a large uh, magnetic field. Uh, you create some energy difference between ground and excited. And then um, you have to cool uh, the system pretty far down before thermal effects stop working to re-excite the system back. But if you are in this regime and you just wait for the relaxation time, you will end up in a ground state with a high fidelity. There are other ways to um, do this. Uh, so you don't need to rely on this equilibration in the ground state to let the system relax. You can actively put it uh, in the desired state by, for example, uh, these uh, optical techniques, laser cooling, uh, optical pumping. Uh, you can perform a quantum measurement, uh, which always projects you into the same state, very powerful. Um, our spin blockade that we discussed a couple lectures ago uh, gives you a way to initialize a qubit because, remember, we send electrons through, but uh, at some point they get stuck, and they always get stuck in a triplet state. So we would then initialize spin qubits in a triplet state so using a spin blockade. Sort of what you want, but a magnet is also a spin generator, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. I already remarked on it. We don't have to go to ground state. Any state will work as long as it's always the same state. OK, for the discussion of gates, I would like to introduce a block sphere. Uh, this is a concept borrowed entirely from spin physics. So it's very nice that we just had a lecture on spin uh, effects. And we're going to have a spin qubit lecture as a next lecture. I think the uh, block sphere is a good concept to have in mind. And uh, it works for 
any qubit really, any two-level system. Uh, the states of a two-level system can be represented on a sphere, and any two-level system can be represented as a spin pointing along that sphere. So in the case of spin, for the zero state, I would put the spin-up state, state along the field, along the magnetic field. For Galileo Marcin, that would be the ground state. And then uh, the excited state, the state that's hard for it to be in, would be the opposite pole. This would be the one state. And the state around this uh, diameter, the center, the equator of the block sphere, uh, what would those states be? Yeah, it will be an equal superposition of uh, 0 and 1. It will be a state like that, 0 plus 1. And you can see, you can have many different superpositions. Well, the two simplest ones are 0 plus 1 and 0 minus 1. Those are two different states. One of them will point along one axis, and the other one will point 90 degrees off. And all the states in between can be described if you add a phase to one of the states. So, for example, 0 plus e to the i phi 1. That describes all the states on the equator of the block sphere. Those are very important states, because uh, many quantum algorithms rely on creating these equal superpositions with different phases. Uh, now, if you are pointing randomly in the block sphere, then uh, you need to uh, have two different angles to describe that. Um, this is coming up in the next slide. But, uh, this gives you a feeling that superpositions of two-level quantum systems can be represented as a, an arrow spin pointing in a 3D space in an arbitrary direction. So for single qubit operations, we need to be able to prepare that arrow pointing in any direction, arbitrary direction. And that usually comes down to being able to rotate around two different axes. For example, x and y. So if you can rotate around y, and then you are somewhere here, and then you rotate around x, oh sorry, around x, you are somewhere here, those two uh, would give you, would dial you to any point on the block sphere. Now for two qubit gates, um, we need something where a state of uh, one of the qubits depends on the state of the other qubit. And um, any such one gate will work. There are different uh, implementations of that, but any one will work. For example, this is a, this is a, a table borrowed from uh, still classical computing, but it shows you uh, basically uh, what a two qubit gate would do. Um, you can see here that the state of the second qubit depends on the state of the first qubit. So if we look at these uh, four numbers, the state of the first qubit is zero, and that means the second qubit is unchanged at the output of the gate. So we go in zero, zero, we come out zero, zero. The second block here, when the first qubit is in one state, the second qubit has to flip. So we start with zero, one, zero, we go to one, one. That's a very simple uh, gate that couples two qubits. This is how it would work on a superposition state. So one qubit is in a superposition state, and the other one is in zero. Well, then what you get at the output is you have to apply this table. So zero, zero stays zero, zero. And one, zero stays uh, one zero. So this will be the control qubit. This is the input qubit. Now, if um, the, um, oh sorry, this is just the multiplication. Now we have to do the, sorry, I got lost here. This is what happens when you don't, don't give a talk with your own slides. Uh, this is just, uh, we just 
put the zero inside the parenthesis here. And now we're going to apply the gate yeah, to this thing. So 0, 0 will become 0, 0, and 1, 0 will become 1, 1. And so uh, we, we done, we've done something profound here because we went from a, a state which can be written down as a product of the two to a state which is an entangled state, cannot be written down as a product of the left and the right qubits. This is an example of a quantum C naught gate, controlled naught gate. So once again, the block sphere um, is a way to represent uh, an arbitrary superposition of a two-level system. And you need to know two angles in the language of spins. One is the rotation from z-axis, that is theta. And one is the rotation in the xy plane, that is phi. And so this formula for spin up and spin down describes an arbitrary superposition. All you need to do to go to any qubit is to replace this with 0 and this with 1. And as a refresher from last lecture, how do you control uh, these qubits? How do you rotate spins? You do a spin resonance. So between spin up and spin down, you go by applying a resonant frequency, a frequency resonant with the level splitting of the two spins with the Larmor frequency, which is the Zeeman energy splitting of the two spins. So for any quantum levels, 0 and 1, you apply a frequency at the energy difference of these two levels. Doesn't have to be spin, can be charge, can be flux, can be quantum levels in an atom. Always the same thing, uh, a resonance. Resonant excitation would drive you from one pole to the other. So the way to think about it is to go into the rotating frame, right? In the lab frame, we have uh, some kind of a quantizing field that keeps uh, the system in the ground state, like that. And you process around it uh, if you are uh, face, uh, pointing in an arbitrary direction. Uh, and uh, in the lab frame, we have an AC magnetic field going like that. But in the rotating frame, we are rotating with that B1 vector. Uh, if it's on resonance, uh, then external field is completely canceled. The effect of it is canceled because we are turning with the arrows. And so in that frame, we're just rotating around this B1 field. And so we can dial to any position from here to here in the rotating frame. So that's a control of one of the angles. So this slide just shows that uh, if we are not exactly on resonance, then we don't fully cancel the big green arrow. We have a, another vector here. And then we are rotating around the sum of green and blue, around something like that. And we are making a, a contour which is like that, as opposed to the being uh, on this um, uh, north to south pole uh, sphere. Now, how to control phi? How to control this angle? Yeah, so the theta is controlled by just going from here and stopping at some point. Phi is controlled by applying B1 along this axis. So if you rotate around this axis, remember x and y rotations, you can get to an arbitrary superposition. How do you rotate B1? It is an AC magnetic field or an AC drive. Well, it's very easy. We, remember, we are in a, a rotating frame. In the rotating frame, we're constantly rotating. And so if we want to see an arrow 90 degrees in front of us, we just have to apply something which has a phase 90 degrees plus to what we apply. So we just have to dial the phase of the microwave generator, and it will turn the blue arrow from here to here. So by changing the phase, we can control the rotation angle in the rotating frame. Well, here are some of the useful uh, operations that come up very often in a quantum computer. Uh, one of them is a full flip. 
So you have to rotate around x, and you go from 0 to 1. So you have to time your rotation to stop it exactly when the arrow uh, is at this point. If you go a little bit longer, you get uh, the wrong superposition. So many of these quantum algorithms rely precisely on timing. Uh, unlike in a classical computer, you can flip this bit and then uh, you are a little bit delayed, but this guy is sitting here waiting. Um, here, you got to kind of orchestrate everything to come to a coincidence because if you just keep this microwave on a little bit longer, it will overpass. And if you keep it a little bit less, uh, it will be here. Another very important one is to go to the equatorial plane to this maximum superposition. This is where you then can create maximum entanglement with two qubit gates. And so this is a, a very important in many algorithms. So the only difference between this one and this one is you have to wait half as long. You turn on the microwave, and uh, in half the time, you turn it off. And you are in the maximum superposition. Here's what you might see if you just uh, do the following experiment. You start in the ground state, and then you start applying microwaves, control. So you go in the rotating frame and uh, start rotating the arrow. And then you stop it and ask, where is the spin? And you vary this time, the control time. So if the control time is 0, you find the spin again pointing up. And if the control time is equivalent to this bit flip, the, the pi angle, you will find the spin facing down. And so this is a, a, a graph of what's happening. Uh, on this axis is the probability to find the spin uh, up or down. Actually, what is plotted here is current, but you have to know what I'm measuring. So I'm just uh, telling you that we start with spin pointing up, and here is when the spin is pointing down. And so the time from here to here would be the time for a single bit flip, for a single quantum gate, which is a bit flip. The time from here to halfway would be the time for a pi over 2 rotation to create the maximum superposition. So the time for a bit flip uh, for this particular curve, I can read it out. Uh, it is something like um, 5 nanoseconds. Because okay? we get two periods over about 20, so one one-fourth of it to go from here to here is about 5. And the time to prepare a maximum superposition would be 2.5 nanoseconds. This curve is known as Rabi oscillations. Uh, that's an experiment came from atomic physics. Uh, and uh, this is where they first measured these uh, probability oscillations between finding your system in a up state and then down state by performing exactly this kind of experiment. Uh, of course, to get probability, you have to do this multiple times. In this case, a million times for each data point. Uh, you can also learn a lot from this uh, curve uh, beyond just the, the times. We figured out how to tell the times of quantum gates. Uh, we can also see how many gates can we do. Yeah? You can see that these oscillations, they start pretty strong. And then they kind of start going uh, smaller. And uh, this one, I'm not even sure if it's there or not. Uh, and if you count them, I did. Uh, it's uh, 13. 13 oscillations. So that means 26 gates where we go from this to this or 52 gates where we go from this to this. That's pretty good. Uh, you can actually do many uh, experiments to demonstrate in principle uh, things like De Vincenzo criteria and little quantum algorithms. But this is nowhere near what you need for a full functioning quantum computer. Actually, you need to be in a regime where you have about 10,000 gates minimum. 
So this curve should go very strong for a long time. And after maybe a thousand of these oscillations, it can be allowed to die down. So what is causing this? This is decoherence. In this particular case, it's coupling to nuclear spins. This is a single electron spin in a nanowire quantum dot. Uh, in another case, it could be something completely different. Charge fluctuators, uh, you name it. Now, how would you implement a two qubit gate? Uh, you have to have two magnets, two spins, two quantum systems that have some kind of coupling between them. So in this case, uh, this is a kind of a classical example. Uh, the two classical magnets would be coupled just by dipole-dipole interaction through because one of the dipoles sits in the magnetic lines of the other dipole. There could also be exchange interaction, um, so quantum wave function overlap of the two systems. Could be capacitive coupling if it's a charge-sensitive qubit. Anything goes. Inductive coupling. And remember what we want to um, perform is, uh, for example, this controlled knot gate where uh, if the A qubit uh, was in a zero state, B qubit didn't change. And if A qubit was in a one state, B qubit flipped. So this would be an example of how you would do that. What you need to have is combine single qubit rotations marked by a, A rotations, and a qubit-qubit coupling, J, A, B. So let's see how it works. Uh, for example, um, Y, A, 90, in this uh, notation means that you rotate around the Y axis by 90 degrees. So you end up pointing in the X direction. Then you allow the qubits to couple for one half the time, which takes you from x to y. And then you do uh, the x rotation by minus 90, and you project back on the z-axis. If uh, the control qubit is in the opposite state, then uh, you reach this point, but you turn in the opposite direction, because the, the, the sign of this coupling will be reversed. So you rotate this way instead of this way. And in that case, after this flip, you end up in the minus one state. So you have to orchestrate uh, the uh, single qubit pulses and some kind of coupling. And it also tells you that you better be able to turn this coupling on and off. Because if it's always on, it will mess up with these pulses as well. Or these have to be much faster than this. Or you want to correct for this coupling being always on. You, want, you may want to add some more rotations to uh, fix for the fact that also during this stage, the two qubits are coupled. So you can re reorthogonalize your gates. But this is kind of thinking that you have to be in. Apply different pulses to different qubits to rotate them on block spheres. And so this is one of the technical challenges and there are all kinds of other challenges. So calibration of pulses, I already mentioned. If you overshoot, you're in the wrong state. If you're undershoot, you're in the wrong state. Uh, there is crosstalk. So you're trying to control this qubit, but this one also sees your control signal. And it can also start uh, being influences. Uh, there could be other couplings, like to a third level. If your system is not spin up and spin down, but it's a spin one system, and you're trying to control just the two levels, uh, you're going to get an admixture of the third level. Um, there could be hardware limitations, uh, like you just cannot produce a uh, high enough quality of the control signal. And of course, as I already mentioned, you have to be able to apply multiple controls to different qubits and uh, do it very fast so that you beat the decoherence. And this is also a difference from a classical computer, where you know, in an Intel chip, we have millions of transistors, but only about 1,000 control lines. Well, with qubits, you cannot get away with that. Pretty much if you have a million qubits, you're going to need a million control lines. So 
there is no good solution for that yet. We're still working on that. Okay, qubit measurement, I uh, already touched upon it. Uh, it has to be a physical process, which gives you a probability to find a system in a zero or a one state. It could be a fluorescence uh, of these two levels. Uh, so one of these levels is actually dark, does not emit, and the other one does. It could be a signal on a physical charge or a flux or a spin detector, which is next to your qubit, so a little circuit. Um, some kind of physical effect. Could be spin blockade, once again, could be a charge sensor, could be a flux sensor. We have to have something like that. And there is a whole bunch of challenges that come with uh, measurement fidelity, which means that uh, you m imagine you have prepared your qubit, the actual quantum state inside your qubit, with extreme accuracy, very well, very well controlled. But then you start to try to read it out, uh, and you get this kind of diagram. You have prepared it exactly in the zero state, but your detector tells you that there is some component of one on the measurement side. Your detector can also be imperfect. Uh, and so how do you deal with that? Well, your best bet is to increase this fidelity, make a really good detector. If that doesn't work, you can just repeat the measurement a million times and kind of uh, do the statistics. There are also some clever ideas where, for example, if you entangle your one qubit with several supporting qubits and auxiliary qubits. And then uh, if you flip the control qubit, uh, by virtue of this coupling, it will flip all the other qubits and sort of amplify your answer. Then you measure three qubits, and you get all these zeros or all these ones. Um, and uh, uh, you boost the probability of your answer. So I, I don't think if, um, there is a consensus on uh, what to do about measurement fidelity. And like I said, the best bet is to just make it higher. Now finally, decoherence. In terms of block sphere, it can be understood as uh, fluctuating fields which point in random directions. Um, so what we want to have is a quantizing field along Z, like a Zeeman splitting inducing field, and then a resonance field that gives us in a rotating frame arbitrary superpositions going around x or y, etc. But there could be other fields around, like in nuclear fields, uh, fields from other spins, uh, which uh, make uh, either this arrow tilt, or if they are at the frequency of our control, they would disturb the phase of the control, etc. Uh, and these fields can come from um, sort of classical degrees of freedom, like fluctuating fields in your generator or in your lab, or quantum degrees of freedom, microscopic level coupling to other two-level systems, other qubits. There are two kinds of decoherence, uh, fundamental kinds of decoherence described by uh, T1 and T2 decoherence times. Uh, T1 is a process that goes like this. Uh, you start in an arbitrary state, and then you collapse onto the ground state. That's a relaxation process. It doesn't have to go like this, like this arrow did. It can just kind of cut through or take any path. The point is uh, you actually give away energy in this process, and you fundamentally lose any knowledge of quantum superposition that you had before because it is gone with a photon or a phonon or whatever spin flip that took place, it's unrecoverable. It's relaxed. So these are the different terms used for, for this kind of process. The other time is T2. That's dephasing time. And that's when you lose a phase in your quantum superposition. So namely, it's a randomization of direction in this xy plane. That's a very important um, relaxation mechanism. Uh, so in your superposition of 0 plus 1, the phase between 0 and 1, if that's scrambled by some interactions, that's dephasing. You lose the phase. Or you don't know which way the arrow is pointing here. So that process, as we stay on, on the equator always, does not cost you energy. Uh, you don't emit the energy. And so actually sometimes you can recover back 
what the quantum state was, if you're clever about what you do. So uh, it is also clear from this that uh, if we relaxed, we also defaced. No longer can re recover which phase you had anymore. So there is a fundamental theorem that show, says that T2 is limited by 2 times T1. Uh, but in practice, uh, in real uh, implementations of qubits, oftentimes we have a problem that T1 is OK, pretty long, and you can do many quantum operations during T1, but T2 is very short. So the Rabi oscillation curve I showed you with 13 oscillations, that's limited by, in fact, T2, not T1. So here's how you can uh, uh, sometimes, uh, well, you ha how you can measure relaxation and dephasing, and how you can recover information. Let's look at these block spheres first. This is how you measure dephasing. Again, you do a pi over 2 pulse to go into, the, into this plane. And what is dephasing? It's a randomization of uh, direction in this plane. Well, if there is no dephasing, you can leave this guy alone for five minutes, half an hour. Come back, it will be still pointing this way. So what you do? You do the pulse opposite direction, like that, or in the same direction, whatever. Uh, project it back onto the z-axis, and you should recover a full amplitude because this whole arrow came back. If there's dephasing, you may be pointing in some other direction. And if you are in some other direction and you rotate around this axis, you're not going to come back to the pole. You're going to come back somewhere else. For example, if you're pointing along this y-axis, you're not going to go anywhere. You're just rotating around yourself. So you're going to be pointing here. If you've rotated by uh, an angle of pi over 2, you're going to go to the opposite direction from what you wanted. So this is how you measure the effect of dephasing. What, after what time, uh, you can no longer tell uh, up from down after the second pulse. Because yeah, uh, remember, we have to repeat this measurement a million times uh, in order to get some uh, probability statistics. And so if every time we end up in a different place, uh, we're not going to get any signal. So we're just going to get something in between up and down. So if we do this pulse and then wait longer than the dephasing time and then read out and do it a million times, there will be zero contrast between 1 and 0, between up and down. But here's how we can reverse the effect of this randomness. It's called spin echo. It's kind of like echo. You, you shout, ooh, and the spin replies in an echo time, ooh. Uh, and uh, this is a powerful technique, came also from uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, school. So here's what you do. Now we are looking from z direction, from the top down. And uh, the first thing we did is we prepared our state along x. So it's pointing along x. And uh, now it's dephasing. Dephasing means it's rotating in the xy plane. And it could be rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. So uh, we draw both. So now what we're going to do is we're going to apply a, a pi pulse. Pi pulse means a rotation by pi around the x-axis. So around the axis to which we brought the system. So around this axis. So this uh, a little bit darker spin was pointing here. And we rotate around this axis, and we flipped it to this side. But why? Uh, why was it pointing here? Because it was kind of turning this way. So now it's here, and it's going to keep on turning this way, because uh, it's seeing this kind of field. So after a time t, it will come back to this angle. So if 
the time of free evolution here is the same as the time of free evolution here, we're going to come back to the same state. So we have, uh, sometimes people call that we defocused the spins here, and we refocused them, and they came back. So the difference between the two sequences is that here we have performed the projection onto the xy plane, then we let it free evolve, and then we project it back onto the z-axis to see where the spin was. Uh, here, in the middle of this process, we have inserted another pulse where we flipped the direction of uh, rotation and all the spins refaced. So it also tells you that the dephasing process can be described by a field in the z direction, by an extra field. Because what is going on here is the arrow starts to rotate, and that is done under the influence of uh, some field pointing out of plane. And the field pointing um, out, out of plane will rotate you this way, and field pointing in plane will rotate you the other way. So if, if the field fluctuates in between the measurements, you will go for a different angle every time. But if you do the pi pulse, no matter what the angle was, you come back to the same state at the end. So that's the power of spin echo. It recovers the coherence of your signal, but you have to time it right. The time t has to be the same. Okay, so the remaining uh, few minutes we will spend uh, looking at different uh, qubit systems that are out there. So this one I already uh, described to you, uh, these molecules uh, that sit in uh, little uh, capsules and you can uh, uh, put them in, uh, in, in huge magnets and then uh, perform uh, megahertz uh, pulses on uh, different spins uh, in this molecule and uh, control this little quantum computer. Uh, the one that is more famous has these seven spins in, a, in this molecule and this one is famous because uh, this is the first time they ran an actual quantum algorithm. Um, so on, a, on millions of these molecules, applying the same sequence of pulses and then reading out the spin echoes, uh, they performed this kind of control. You ca can see seven lines, and all these little dashes are things like pi pulses and pi over two pulses and entanglements between the different spins done by microwave techniques, by NMR techniques. And then at the end of the day, they read it out. Uh, they read out the probabilities, and they were able to conclude that the number 15 is a product of 3 and 5. I think the, an the actual answer was something like 4.2 and 2.8. <laughs> I, I don't remember exactly, but um, it's kind of funny, but it, it, is a, it was a breakthrough experiment in the field of quantum computing. So, so this made this molecule very, very famous, but you can see the problem here. This approach is not scalable. What if I need to factor a number 17? Well, I cannot do that, but uh, 20, right? So I, I'm going to need more qubits, uh, and uh, wh wh what am I going to do? I'm going to stick more uh, chemicals on it, so I'm going to go back to the synthesizing lab and create a new molecule. That's not scalable. This approach is much more scalable, and this is this uh, calcium uh, plus ion that I already mentioned to you, um, or some other ion. Uh, these are single atoms that are confined in uh, electrostatic traps. This is the design of the trap. So these single ions, they're sitting in, a, in space, in free space, held together by uh, electric fields. And uh, you can see individual ions because uh, they scatter off light uh, very efficiently. Uh, and then, uh, in order to control these ions, uh, you have to apply um, laser pulses to them. So you have a bunch of lasers going into this thing. Uh, and uh, if you want to couple them, you can maybe bring them close together. Then you can do some two qubit gates. And so these people have succeeded some years ago to a couple eight qubits. Uh, last thing I heard was 40 qubits. 
40 different qubits. That's amazing. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure by now it's already even more, maybe 100. Uh, the setup is very complicated because uh, this requires quite a few laser pulses to control this thing. So you, you have a bunch of lasers going into a little trap which is trapped literally somewhere inside this mess. So there are also questions about how scalable this will be ultimately. Can we get 10,000 of these? Do we need 10,000 lasers? Uh, but for now, they are one of the leading implementations of qubit, just in terms of the number of things you can control. This is how the trap looks. Uh, they machine uh, these electrodes, or sometimes they make them in the clean room, and they trap atoms in between these electrodes, the little atoms. This is a superconducting uh, variety of circuits. Uh, one, two, three, four different uh, uh, circuits which are unified by the fact that they're all superconducting and include Josephson junctions. But they are all somewhat different. Um, in all of them, however, you can observe these uh, Rabi oscillations uh, between two superconducting states. Maybe flux flowing this way and flowing this way. Or sometimes the states are charged states. A charge on this island and a charge outside. These systems are doing very well as well. These are maybe among the solid state implementations which have advantage of being scalable because you can just draw this circuit and put the next one over, next one over uh, on a chip like in a computer. So all these advantages. Superconducting qubits are doing very well. Spin qubits. I uh, already told you that you can do uh, Rabi oscillations with single spins. You can also do optical experiments on these uh, kind of excitonic quantum dots, self-assembled ones. Uh, you can do multiple dots. This is an example where they have made uh, two dots into two qubits. So you can scale them up like that. And we will discuss uh, the solid state implementations in separate lectures. So now I just want to flash very quickly. Uh, finally, um, a very promising system, though there are also concerns about the scalability, is a hybrid between atomic and solid state. It's a little defect in a diamond crystal. Uh, you stick in a nitrogen atom, and one of the other carbon atoms is not there. So it's called a ni nitrogen vacancy defect site. And this thing behaves like a spin one half particle. And it is in a diamond lattice which is so robust that it protects this defect even at room temperature from the environment. So you are in solid state, you're in a crystal lattice, but you are like a single atom. So then you can combine these uh, well-developed uh, laser techniques to do coherent control on these single nitrogen vacancy centers. And by now, people also implemented little quantum registers that contain spin here and a couple of nuclei around, maybe. So they, they have uh, advanced this field very strongly. And uh, at Pitt, we have a group of Gurudev Dutt who works exactly on this system. So it's one of the most promising qubits right now, represented here. Then finally, people who work with photons uh, are also having a, a great time uh, playing with uh, uh, their qubit. And uh, you can do it entirely in your lab. But one of the cool things about photons is that you can send them far away. And they c remain coherent. So they are doing experiments like uh, send uh, quantum superpositions from Geneva to Lausanne, which is uh, about uh, several tens of kilometers along this beautiful lake. Uh, or they go to Tenerife, uh, to the, what are they called, the islands? Where are they here? No. I'm blanking out on the name of these islands, but they are beautiful islands. And they send uh, signals from, the, from a mountain on one island to the mountain on the other island. Uh, and uh, they send the superposition, and they catch it later. So they do quantum communication experiments. And there is even a company that sells quantum cryptography equipment, which uh, they try to market ultimately to banks and, and things like that, protect the sensitive bank information. Uh, I think also in China, there is now a, an experiment where they sent uh, quantum information over 
a long distance, like 100 kilometers or more. Also to satellite? Um, I don't think yet. That would, be, that would be wonderful. That would be cool. OK, so to wrap it up, uh, this is a summary slide for all the different qubits. I'm just going to put them all on. And um, this is a state of the game uh, a few years ago. And so all these lines moved a little bit up. So we have more qubits by a few, not by orders of magnitude. And our qubits are, can do more gates. Uh, but roughly, the relative combination is the same. Uh, these kind of ions uh, maybe now surpass the NMR. Uh, semiconductor qubits, I am sorry to say, are right now the worst. But we are still hoping to thrust ahead and be over here off the scale. Uh, superconducting qubits are doing much better now. So these lines have moved. But uh, we are still in a few qubit regime and a few tens of gates regime. We're not where we want to be. We have uh, challenges. Um, we have challenges with keeping the qubits coherent. We have challenges with controlling them. We have challenges with scaling it. And uh, this slide is from Levin van der Seypen. Uh, he is one of the leaders in the qubit field. And uh, his strong belief is that we can do it if we uh, really want to. And uh, to me, really want to means if we get a lot more support. <laughs> so here I stop. And next time we talk about spin qubits.